doing this video for you today to talk about the different types of intentional torts. You know, in your book, you're about uh, tort law in general. And um, I did a video earlier on the kind of some broad concepts that relate to tort law that go across the different types of torts. And I talked a little bit about strict liability since I'm not doing a separate video on strict liability. Um, but what I wanted you to know is about um, the intentional torts, which are different than negligent. And as I um, in the earlier video, we do have, um, I did find a pretty good negligence video for you to listen to if you um, have more interest in that. So right now I'm going to talk about intentional torts. A couple of things about intent. When you think of intent, like in common language, we usually think of somebody who's um, doing something because they're angry or upset. In tort law, when we talk about intent, though, we talk about intent as being um, like voluntary or deliberate conduct that results in, since we're talking about tort law, that results in an injury or damage to property. And I'll talk a little more about the, a couple of different types of intentional torts later. But the idea is that under tort law, if you act in a way that's deliberate and voluntary, as opposed to negligence, where negligence is you're careless in essence, and your conduct is just because you didn't pay attention to the breach of duty, but you weren't deliberately, voluntarily doing something. And intent is you're voluntarily, deliberately doing something. And the intent then is determined by, mostly by your conduct. And it can be actual or it can be implied from your conduct. In this picture, oh, you know what, in the previous picture I wanted to mention that in the previous picture, what we looked at was, um, and I can't go back to it, was a hockey game where people often have fights. I was recently at a hockey game and there were a couple of fights. And there were a couple of times when people um, deliberately, maybe didn't raise the stick all the way, but raised it a little bit, bumped into people, a couple of people tripped um, players, that's intentional conduct. Now, it might be out of an evil intent, which is what the current slide is about, about motive, but um, definitely it was deliberate conduct on the part of the players against other team, against the members of the other team. Now, on the other hand, um, the law doesn't require that there be that evil intent. And if you watch mysteries on TV, you know they talk a lot about motive. Why did somebody do something? They must have had an evil intention to do something. And that makes for great TV drama. And certainly it helps persuade a jury that someone probably did it. But intent is different than motive. Motive is why someone did something. Intent and intentional tort is uh, what they did whether they did it deliberately or not, not necessarily why they, they did it, or not necessarily that they had an evil motive when they did it. A couple of defenses to intentional torts before we move into a couple, the couple of examples that I want to talk about. One defense is consent. And you can see on the slide I have a consent and a release form from Dream, DreamWorks Productions. Um, the idea of consent is that it, you agree to accept the possibility that you might get injured if you participate in the activity with whoever the actor is. Now what happens this consent form is about DreamWorks filming and the possibility of being hurt somehow during the filming. By entering the area, you're consenting. And so if you get hurt, unless it's something very egregious, very severe, you know, you've consented to be hurt or the possibility of being hurt. Going back to the hockey game, 
when you agree to play hockey, you consent to a certain amount of being hit, tripped, battered. You consent to that as part of the game. So at the end of the hockey game that I watched, the player who was hit could not then file an intentional tort lawsuit against the player for the other team that hit him. That's because when he agreed to play hockey, he consented to being hit, even hit illegally. He consented to being hit illegally. Now that consent only goes so far. Um, oh, about maybe 30 years ago, there was a case where not only did the hockey player get hit, but um, the other player picked up his hockey stick and beat the player almost unconscious. When you play hockey, you don't consent to that kind of beating. And that's what the New York court decided, is that yes, you consent to being beat up, you get consent to being tripped, you get consent to somebody lifting a stick even and hitting you. Um, you don't consent to being beaten senseless. That's not part of what you consent to. So there's a limit to what you consent to when you play hockey or play football or play basketball or tennis or swimming or any of those sports where there's a certain amount of injury that's part of part of the sport. The other defense, in addition to uh, consent, that I wanted to mention is self-defense or defense of others. Now self-defense applies to defending your person, not defending your property. So self-defense wouldn't work if, say, someone was stealing from the store that you owned and as they were running out the store you shot them in the back. That's not self-defense. There you're defending property because they took something with them. When you're defending property you can't use deadly force. Now if you're defending yourself, if they grab something and they're running toward you, then that's a different question. But if they are leaving with your property, you don't have the right to use deadly force. Uh, Self-defense also includes others' defense. Typically, the others are someone close to you, either family or friends. That's the others that you can defend. Defending people in the general community, that probably wouldn't work as a defense to a tort. So now I want to talk about some of the um, intentional torts. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I do want to talk about a few of them. Now note that if you are found liable of committing an intentional tort, it's likely that you would have to pay punitive damages. So that's damages in addition to the economic damages, for example, lost wages or medical expenses or um, uh, the cost of transportation or those things that are related to directly to the injury. You would, uh, you would also have to pay punitive damages to punish you for engaging in the intentionally tortious conduct. So the first intentional tort I want to talk about is an intentional tort to protect persons and it's assault. Intentional non-consensual act that gives rise to the apprehension that a harmful or offensive act is imminent. You may recognize this scene. Uh, this scene is a, a, a simulation. I don't think it's the actual scene. A simulation from uh, The Matrix where um, Oh, I can't think of the guy uh, who fights himself, and he has multiples of himself, and he fights himself. The reason this picture is an assault is because there's a, uh, the person kicking has caused an apprehension that a harmful, harmful conduct or harmful contact is about to happen. See, the foot's raised. It looks like it's going to kick him. Um, the victim is moving out of the way and the victim may not be afraid as in oh I'm so scared but they're apprehensive they are on alert that a harmful contact might happen and that's what the assault is it's also non-consensual assault applies not only to um, contacting the person or attempting to contact the person but you know, like maybe if he had kicked his coat, for example. Okay, moving on to the next one, uh, battery. 
is an intentional, non-consensual, harmful, or offensive contact with the plaintiff's person. So the assault is causing fear that they might contact them. The battery is the actual contact. And as you can see from the picture, uh, now he has the person down and he has his arm twisted behind his back. That's contact, and therefore that would be a battery. Note that you can have a battery without an assault, and you can have an assault without a battery. The battery um, can happen without the assault if the um, wrongdoer had run up behind him and pushed him down and then grabbed his arm. So that would be a battery without an assault. There's no assault there because he didn't cause fear or apprehension of injury because he didn't see it. So um, you can have one without the other. One of the torts that businesses are concerned with is um, being able to stop shoplifters. So the slide is a picture of someone putting a CD in their pocket. And let's presume that it's probably not because they paid for it first, especially since it's not in the case. Um, shopkeepers have the right, have a privilege, to stop someone for a reasonable period of time and uh, not be liable for false imprisonment. So false imprisonment is the intentional non-consensual confinement by physical barriers or physical force or threats of force. Uh, the plaintiff has to know about it and uh, have suffered harm as a result of the confinement. So the issue comes up for businesses when they want to stop shop, shoplifters and they need to detain them until the police arrive. If they do that and they have a reasonable basis for stopping the person, they stop them for a reasonable period of time, then they're not liable for false imprisonment. Other intentional torts against property include trespass, conversion, and nuisance. Be sure to read through those in the book. I'm not going to take the time to go through those in detail now. Um, there are also intentional torts relating to economic relationships and interfering with those such as um, negatively talking about someone's product or interfering with a contractual relationship in a way that's not protected by law. Um, those are other types of economic um, torts against the property. Again, just look through those in the chapter. The last intentional tort that I want to talk about is um, defamation or wrongful communication. When we talk about wrongful communication, we're talking about someone saying something or writing something that is harmful and damages someone's reputation or a business's reputation. You can see the image that I have on the slide is someone holding a phone and talking, but defamation isn't only verbal. It can also be written. That includes writing it on a blog. A recent issue with that is for companies like Yelp, where people can post reviews, and uh, some businesses have been arguing that those are wrongful communications, that they're defamatory, and want to hold companies like Yelp liable. Um, they're not liable so far, but uh, that is a, a recent issue that where there's an overlap between the technology and the uh, tort law and tort law hasn't quite caught up with the technology. Uh, so I've defined, explained the example of defamation, that's communication to a third party. It has to be an untrue statement of fact. The statement of fact is something that could be verified, and then it has to damage reputation. There are defenses to defamation. Look in the book to see what those defenses are. Truth is the most absolute defense. If something is true, then it's not an untrue statement of fact. So there would be no liability. Again, uh, look through the book on that. So thank you for listening, and I will see you online.